Stocks seesaw after a weak open as uncertainty around global growth and monetary policy actions cloud sentiment, metals and financials trade weak, while healthcare and IT show resilience. Indus Towers has asked Vodafone Idea to pay its dues or face discontinuation of tower services. Sources tell CNBC TV18 the, the missive following a board meet of the towers major clears the pitch for the troubled telco. Torrent Pharma is set to acquire cosmetic dermatology focused Curatio Healthcare for 2,000 crores in a move that is seen as a pricey bid for a foray into a high potential segment. The stock slips today. Godrej Properties gains on a land deal in Bangalore. Gujarat Alkalis is boosted by new capacity, whereas Madhusan Sumi wiring perks up on hopes of a bonus issue. Supriya Life Science, on the other hand, sulks after its CEO steps down. And the rupee hits a new low in step with other Asian currencies as the PBOC fixes the yuan lower than expected at 7.22 per dollar. The rise in US yields and the dollar index also hit the rupee and other emerging market currencies. Hello and welcome to Halftime Report. I'm Ikta Bhatra and with me Sonia Shinoi as well as Mangalam Malu. Well, it's turning out to be a session where we are jittering less than the globe, but we are still jittering at this point in time. The rupee has hit a fresh record low on an intraday basis today. We have recovered around 200 points for the Nifty on an intraday basis, but remember that there are a lot of big queues which are lined up in the next couple of India, but separately the guidance going forward, how hawkish they could be, would be something that would be the on the streets mind considering the kind of depreciation that we are working with on the repeat today lot of stocks in focus torrent pharma supriya life obviously i'll start by talking about them but separately something like godrich properties and even something like a madison sumi wiring which is in focus oh absolutely Aikta, hi afternoon mangalam afternoon. afternoon so you know as someone was saying earlier right i mean it's like uh, when an earthquake happens and all the buildings around you are shaking and your own building for now is not shaking as much but it doesn't mean that you're not in trouble right at some point in time there's going to be catch up i think that's what's happening in our own markets for the week the uh, or rather for the month the index is down four percent this month already and uh, yes, there's been a significant route across, I mean, even in the broader markets, the mid caps, etc. But purely for today, we are holding on to 17,000, which is, I guess, not such a bad thing. It's not a bad thing because, you know, what happened is that yesterday our low was pretty close to the 20 day moving, a uh, 200 day moving average. And today's low is very close to the 200 day exponential moving average. Between 16,870 and 16,990 is where both the 200 day moving average is exponential as well as the daily simple moving averages are. So maybe it is uh, the first test of those 200 day moving averages and we are seeing the bounce from lows. What happens uh, from here on will be extremely crucial to watch out for, especially with regards to what the FIs are doing. And that would be, uh, you know, something that would be correlated to the way the rupee is moving. And finally, it's also the expiry that we will have tomorrow for the September series. So that would be a fair amount of volatility. But so far, the mid cap index is doing well and we've recovered from the low. So things are not looking as bad as one would have feared. But uh, Let's move on and talk about uh, individual stocks then. Sources tell CNBC TV18 that the Indus Towers board met earlier this week and some of its directors have flagged concerns over mounting dues from Vodafone Idea. Nimesh joins in with the details of that. Nimesh. On the 26th of uh, September board meet, uh, the independent directors of Indus Tower have taken a very strong view uh, about the mounting dues from Vodafone Idea. Now, <clears throat> You know, uh, the, 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 in a very strongly worded letter to, to Vodafone Idea, they've said that, you know, uh, uh, the, the service, there could be service closures on the non-payment of dues. And uh, they've, uh, they've, they're seeking for immediate repayment of all the past dues, as well as, uh, you know, regular payments henceforth. Now, uh, 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 you know, according to numbers, close to 7,000 crores is the outstanding due of Vodafone Idea towards Indus Tower. In fact, for the last many months, uh, Indus, uh, Vodafone Idea has been able to pay only 30, 40 to 50 percent of the regular dues, uh, for which now uh, the letter very clearly says that uh, for this month, they want at least 80 percent of the money to be released. And from November onwards, entire 100 percent of the monthly dues should be paid. Uh, uh, not, not only that, you know, they, it's, a, it's a very strong letter that, you know, going forward, if they're able, not able to repay the money, there could be serious threat on the, on the service closures as well on few sites. If you look at the quarter one number of Indus Tower and the management commentary as well, uh, the Indus Tower had actually made a pro doubtful uh, debt provision 
of 12-30 crores in quarter one. And they have been, uh, in a, even in the con call, they have said that one of the clients has been uh, delaying the payments as well. So this is what, uh, you know, uh, it's a very serious letter which has been put out to Vodafone Idea from Indus Tower. A couple of things to watch out going forward. One, uh, you know, the big question is, will the Vodafone Idea promoters uh, infuse fresh capital into the company? That's been a key, key uh, you know, key point uh, which everybody's been watching out for. Even for the government's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, spectrum needs to be converted into equity. Uh, there needs to be a, a, f a full commitment uh, or a strong commitment from the Vodafone I I idea promoters. That's not coming through. So there are there are a lot of question marks on uh, you know how and when uh, the the Vodafone idea promoters will put in money. But uh, coming November, uh, the the letter very clearly indicates that if there is uh, if there is further delay and the payments are not made, there could be serious threat in terms of service closures uh, or non-payment of dues from Vodafone idea. Okay, Nimesh, uh, thanks a lot for that. Well, moving on, Torrent Pharma has acquired Curatio Healthcare for 2,000 crores, but the stock is under pressure today. Uh, Ekta has been telling us how it seems to be quite an expensive acquisition for them. Ekta, over to you. Well, Sonia, you know, it's also an interesting acquisition mm -hmm. because I've really been working the phones the entire morning to understand uh, what the street likes and dislikes about this particular acquisition. So, for example, it, the total acquisition size is around 2,000 odd crores. They are buying 100% in the company. But it, uh, this particular company has a strong presence in the cosmetic dermatology market. Now, this cosmetic dermatology market focused on pediatrics. I'm sure a lot of us, Sonia, I'm sure you must have used these a couple of these brands or at least heard about them within the pediatric space. So, for example, Teddy Bar, which is uh, around a 76 crore brand, it's 34% of sales for this particular company. At Gola, which is basically for atopic dermatitis for kids. Uh, Spoo, which is a sulfate-free uh, shampoo. Before Nappy, which is a popular nappy cream. So, top 10 of these brands are around 75% of the company's sales. So, they have a strong concentration in terms of sales, but they are growing. So, they are expected to cross 270 25 crores in terms of total sales in FY23. This compares to around 224 crores that they did in FY22. Now margins, yes, they are a bit dilutive. So these are the deal concerns which I'm just going to list out. The deal itself is valued at uh, around seven times sales to um, sales to price on an FY24 basis. So the street finds this deal expensive. Margins of the acquired business are slightly lower. So, for example, they would work out to be around 25-odd percent. Uh, Torrent has higher margins. So, the street is anticipating that hopefully synergies will allow the company to increase their margins. 75 to 85 percent of the company's deal will be funded by a debt, though they've said that by FY25, they should probably reduce the debt. Uh, 60% of their sales will now come in from the domestic business, which has been doing well. For example, it was up 14% in FY23. Um, brokerages seem to be positive. Uh, you know, they really haven't changed their stance, which is indicative of how negative you could be. So, City is neutral. They say it's a good strategic fit, but uh, it is expensive. And that's the similar kind of, uh, you know, statement which is brought out by the likes of Credit Suisse and the others as well. That, yes, expensive. But there are some positives in terms of, you know, entering the dermatology segment, etc. The management did hold a call last evening. So let's listen in to what they had to say. We expect that uh, this year uh, the growth should sustain uh, and uh, possibly the touch about 275 crores. And uh, uh, the gross margins of the business are quite identical to uh, the, the, the base business that we have currently, the Tor in India business. And uh, while the margins of the acquired business are uh, 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 slightly lower, I think there is a possibility to bring these margins up to the uh, existing India-based business uh, level in the near term. Uh, so there are uh, uh, possibilities for synergies both on the cost and revenue side uh, that, are, that we see visible and uh, hopefully should start playing out within the next uh, uh, couple of quarters. And uh, uh, we will keep uh, everyone informed on the progress uh, as we move along. It's more appropriate to look at uh, the multiples on, on the current year basis rather than the trailing year basis, particularly because this is a asset which is still in a, in a build-out phase. And uh, we see a reasonable growth potential that's uh, yet to be uh, seen in terms of top line. And given that uh, the top line base is uh, still relatively smaller compared to our existing base, uh, the operating leverage should start playing out in terms of margins. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I think uh, both uh, factors here, the top line growth, which would be higher than the industry uh, growth, plus possibly our base business growth, and the additional levers for margin expansion as we go along, 
That's why we felt this uh, uh, is, is a justified uh, opportunity. I think FY22 numbers, uh, uh, which were there in the public domain, was that top line of 224 with uh, a bit of little over 60 crores. So that's the kind of margin which it has made in FY22. And uh, with this, uh, with the growth being significantly higher than uh, FY22 this year, as we spoke that uh, YTD basis, uh, the business has been growing at 25%, and uh, we should uh, expect this momentum to continue for the full year. The operating leverage is playing out much better way. The margins should be uh, reaching uh, the margins which we have for our base uh, India business. From an overall company perspective, uh, it's a little higher than uh, the overall uh, company EBITDA margin. So uh, from that perspective, it's not going to be dilutive uh, from a company perspective. In terms of cost synergies, uh, what we are looking at is uh, uh, from a procurement perspective, so basically the uh, COGS, uh, there should be some improvement uh, which will start flowing in uh, because uh, I think between Kirashio and Torrent, uh, Torrent has a better reach and uh, negotiating power. Uh, the other one is of course the productivity improvement which is uh, going to span out over the next few years. And the third is um, certain fixed expenses uh, where our uh, cost structure is more efficient compared to Kirashio. So once this business is merged and come to the same platform, there would be cost synergies flowing in. On immediate basis, at least for the next one or two years, we are not looking at any incremental investments. Okay, that's on Torrent Pharma, but there are plenty of other stocks in the news today. Sonal is here to tell us more about that. Sonal, over to you. Hey, Sonia. Well, four stocks on my radar today. Supriya Life Sciences, where the CEO has resigned due to personal reason. Uh, the CEO is, of course, Sharish Ambaikar, who will be uh, taking a leave or relieving from September 30th itself. However, he will be extending services on a retainership basis in the company. And the new CEO will be appointed, that is Mr. Rajiv Kumar Jain, with, uh, from October 3rd. So that stock is declining on the back of this resignation. We have Gujarat Alkalis, which is trading in the green today because manufacturing unit of hydrazine hydrate that has started at their Dahej complex with a capacity of 10,000 tons per annum. It is a forward integration project to produce hydrogen peroxide, which is an import substitute for the company. Uh, Mothersen Wiring, that is also surging in trade today because the company will be considering bonus issue on September 30th. And lastly, lastly Godrej Properties, because they have uh, acquired a land parcel in Bengaluru. Uh, seven acre uh, is the size of that particular land parcel in Indranagar extension and it will have an estimated booking value potential of around 750 crore rupees. So, so the street likes that and the stock is higher in trade today. Okay. All right, uh, Sonal. Thanks very much for that. So a whole bunch of stocks in focus. We'll take a short break on that note. But up, up next, uh, Lata Venkatesh will be joining in to put a focus on the asset class of the rupee decode whether the rupee is possibly uh, going to even touch 82 and break that. Welcome back. Uh, let's take a bit of a breather from the equity markets and talk about currencies now. The rupee opened today at a fresh record low of 81.90 versus the US dollar. Lata is here uh, to tell us what's happening there. 82 on the cards. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, when and not if. Lata, over to you. Well, it's actually a double whammy now for Asian currencies. It's not anymore talking only about US yields. We have to talk about China. Uh, the Chinese uh, currency saw... a much lower fixing today. You know, Chinese currency doesn't, uh, it's not entirely market determined. The PBOC determines a midpoint and allows the currency to float around it. The new midpoint, which everyone thought would come closer to 7.16 per dollar, which was yesterday's close, came in at 7.22, which was quite a surprise. They actually allowed or enforced a depreciation. And so all Asian currencies are showing that impact. And of course, the rupee was no exception. Uh, right from the word go, we started off at uh, 81.90. Uh, what dealers tell us is that there is a, a, a persistent dollar offering, which they are guessing is from the Reserve Bank. And they are guessing that because of this offer, 81.94 is not getting crossed. Uh, also, the rupee looks like a relative outperformer because at 81.94, 90, 
it is about 0.3.4 lower than previous close. The Korean won is one and a quarter percent lower than yesterday's close. The Chinese yuan itself is down 0.75 versus yesterday's close. So clearly this is, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a worldwide phenomenon. And just to add, U.S. yields overnight crossed 4%, the 10-year that is, uh, which is a fresh 13-year uh, high. And uh, the U.S. data came very robust. The consumer confidence as well as new home sales. New home sales were 28% higher than June, the July numbers, whereas they were actually expected to fall by about 0 0.05. So, uh, you know, uh, strong noises coming from Fed governors who spoke like Bullard and Evans as well. And uh, therefore, the market now is not looking like uh, there is any immediate peaking off uh, of the dollar or bot bottoming out of the currency. At least for the moment, there's more to go. All right, Lata, thanks a lot for that. Uh, there's more to go for the moment. Uh, meanwhile, at the bottom of your screen, some flashes coming in from Krishna Diagnostics. They plan to launch 600 new centers across uh, the country. Uh, shortly, we will get speaking with the management as well. But before we do that, uh, our colleague Timsi Jaipuria caught up with Nitin Gupta, who's the chairman of the Central Board of Direct Taxes, to ask him about the state of tax collections post the second quarter advanced tax numbers. And how the tax department is actually reaching out to those who've made money via online gaming. Net collections are 7.04 crore, uh, which is 23% higher than what was on the last year on the same date. So it's a quite a robust collection and uh, in gross terms we are growing at 30% as of now. So we believe that uh, there is a good uh, momentum in terms of tax collections, the taxpayers are yes recognizing that what they have to pay, they should pay. And let us see the uh, position in the third advanced tax when it comes to December. So we'll know the real position at that point in time, how the collections are moving. When we talk of plugging the leakages, plugging the loopholes, online gaming sector is something that has uh, actually now come to the radar of the IT department. When it comes to reaching out to those taxpayers who have actually won a lot of money in online gaming, in betting, etc., and have not declared their uh, proper declarations in terms of the winning prize that they have got, how much is the estimate as to what could be the potential of this sector? I'm sure a lot of notices have been already sent uh, to these winners to kindly declare their uh, contribution and uh, come back with the taxes? Uh, we, we had mounted an action in this sector and uh, determined uh, that around 58,000 crore of winnings were there in last three years and uh, the data is with us. We are in the process of issuing notices. It's not the notice per se that we are issuing any summons or anything. We are putting it on the uh, uh, compliance portal and then they can respond to it so that uh, there is a non-intrusive way of reaching to them and nudging them to pay the taxes if they have not paid the taxes. So it's a, uh, the, 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 they are expected to voluntarily comply of payment of taxes and that is the uh, process where we are. When we talk of online gaming companies, uh, a lot of these companies are also trying to evade taxes by doing fake invoicing, by under-reporting their uh, uh, actual collections. Have you also reached out to any company running online gaming portal, etc., to come forward, do the compliance and come clean uh, before tax department issues a formal summon? Mm, we, we do enforcement action and wherever we find that we have a uh, information or data which is uh, backed by evidences, such notices are issued and uh, we don't uh, that way segregate any particular company on this account mm -hmm. of bogus mm -hmm. and debiting of expenses or something. Okay, so that's the CBDT chairperson, but let's concentrate on a particular company. Mangalam just mentioned that Krishna Diagnostics is launching uh, retail healthcare services across India. We do have the management of uh, Krishna Diagnostics, which is uh, joining in to discuss exactly this. They will be uh, launching 600 diagnostic centers 
across uh, the country. And the center will offer specialized services in a host of segments. To discuss more about this, Pallavi Jain, who is the MD of the company, now joins in. Um, Pallavi, hi. Thank you very much for joining in. Uh, so I just want to, you know, just get this clarification out of the way. These 600 new centers that you are launching are simply diagnostic centers that you will be launching across the country. So uh, your press release clearly says that it will be equipped to offer specialized services in precision medicine, genetics, genomics, molecular diagnostics, which a lot of diagnostic companies already offer. Secondly, it will also provide routine investigations as well as possibly dedicated services for women's health, which is hormones, PCOD, diabetes, monitoring, etc. So primarily, these are diagnostic centers which you are offering, um, you know, across the country, and not retail healthcare services, which would be probably medical-related services such as, you know, hospitalization, etc. Just want to make that clarification. Yeah, so basically I uh, wanted to just clarify, firstly, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, we are coming up uh, in the B2B and B2C segment. To be more specific, uh, instead of just uh, starting 600 diagnostic centers would not be the right comment. Uh, we are leveraging our Pan-India network uh, where, you know, we are already, we've proven ourselves to be the best uh, premium diagnostic service provider. So we are going to tie up and uh, with small labs, hospitals, uh, and make sure that uh, we can leverage our existing uh, facilities. And we will be the, uh, I think, first one to have integrated diagnostics uh, facilities wherein we will be offering radiology and pathology services through our these uh, B2C segmented uh, 600 plus uh, diagnostic centers. So uh, we are now entering into a new uh, market uh, which was untouched by us. Uh, yes, there are several players. Uh, we have always been uh, largely known to be a PPP service provider. But uh, post pandemic, we saw a lot of people wanted these kind of services. And hence, after working on a suitable model, uh, we have decided to enter this market. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to understand the economics of this, Pallavi. You know, these 600 centers that you have planned to open or enter into partnerships, etc. What is the kind of money that you will be spending on that? Uh, and by when do you reach that 600 number? And secondly, what's the kind of revenue you anticipate coming in from this? Yeah, so uh, it is going to be an asset light model, as I uh, uh, informed earlier that we already have established ourselves in the, in the market. We are now only going to leverage our network. We are going to strengthen, we have already strengthened our back-end uh, support system, which is, you know, our IT infrastructure, our labs. So it will be more like an asset light model, wherein uh, we are not going to invest more in making uh, infrastructure investment. Uh, we are leveraging the existing infrastructure, what we have in the uh, uh, states. We are present in uh, 16 states, two union territories at about 2,000 plus locations. And we are just going to leverage this network and uh, start this model. Uh, revenue, we are uh, uh, going to be, uh, as you, are, you know that Krasna is known to be uh, one of a premium service provider, but at the same time giving all these services at a very, very affordable cost to the public and this is also going to continue because that's the vision we have seen that to get uh, affordable and accessible health care at the doorstep so we are not going to uh, uh, deviate from that motto of ours. Uh, right now currently immediately telling you about uh, the revenues would not be appropriate because uh, we are starting it and uh, as uh, we have shown results in our previous business models uh, and our uh, 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 past me, experience, uh, we are sure to create sure. a difference. Sure, sure. I think what uh, my colleague was also trying to understand more than revenues is break even, right? Because these are 600 new centers that you will be launching. Uh, what would the operational um, efficiencies be of this? When do you think you can break even on these centers? So that's that's exactly what I'm I'm telling you. Uh, we are not going to invest in the infrastructure mm. in making these diagnostic centers. This is going to be a tie-up with small laboratories, small hospitals who have reached to us uh, and are willing to partner with us. Uh, and we are going to leverage the existing network. Uh, what we have, we are already present in hospitals. We are already present in government facilities. We are already present pan India at multiple locations. 
So it will be more like a logistically driven uh, 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 planning we will do. And uh, that's the reason there won't be uh, much of investment to be done here. It's going to be a very, very asset light model. Uh, so I don't think we are worried about break even. I think we, uh, we would be able to start getting in and uh, building in our revenues uh, the day we start the project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pallavi, you know, as we all have seen, the entire diagnostic industry has completely changed post-COVID. There's intense competition within this space. And diagnostic companies themselves are now foraying into radiology simply because it's parallel. It probably provides even higher margins. Um, and they need growth at the end of the day. So what makes you think that these 600 centers, despite the fact that it is going to be an asset light model, is going to differentiate you in any way against the competition that the industry is facing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, the new entrants will have to, uh, you know, uh, build everything from uh, the beginning. Uh, develop, make the centers, make investments in infrastructure. We have already proven ourselves to be a premium service provider. Our uh, services are, uh, uh, you know, being appreciated by the public at large. Uh, during COVID also, we were very, very uh, well accepted by the common people where we want to reach them. Uh, that, you know, the rates are very, very low. Almost, uh, if you compare us with any of our uh, uh, competitors, we are 60% uh, lower in our radi radiology sector and we are almost 80% lower in some of our pathology tests, which already gives us a, 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 a upper hand in the market. And uh, with the experience, expertise and the team we have, I'm sure uh, uh, we will be able to create a difference. What we've done in the last 10 years, we continue to grow and we will continue to make the difference to the society and make sure that, you know, best quality healthcare services reach to masses and common people of our country. Right, and we thank you for that as a community for, you know, ensuring that it is affordable and it takes care of uh, the community at large. But just a final couple of uh, numbers, if you could give us, you know, uh, incremental volume growth, what could it be on account of uh, this foray that you've done? And secondly, Will at any point your average revenues per user be, uh, you know, per patient be compromised because of this or will it increase? Uh, how much can it increase by? Last year you did around 975 rupees per patient. No, so um, uh, I don't think so. Uh, it will uh, uh, increase for the user at large. Yes, of course, but definitely uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, that we are coming up with genomics, we are coming up with some super speciality test uh, that whenever that kind of test is required by uh, people, uh, it will definitely be uh, at a different uh, cost. But yes, all put together, it will uh, definitely be uh, lower than the private market rates. Uh, in terms of volumes, uh, uh, we are expecting to take this in phase wise. So maybe, you know, uh, once we do a phase one in a, a uh, about 100, 150 centers, we will be able to complete this entire 600 centers in, a, uh, say, about six months' time. Uh, and only then we will be able to uh, come up with uh, numbers. Right now, we've considered to uh, just come in the market because uh, that's the need of the hour and uh, reach out to people where our services are needed. Okay, all right, Pali, we're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So that's largely a repurposing of or maybe even a tie-up of uh, to launch diagnostic centers across the country. That's Krishna Diagnostics. If you look at it as compared to its 52-week high, it's been a significant underperformer, down around 40% from those so levels. It's, it's a routine course of business for them, right? This uh, is what they largely, do, tie, yes, tie they're, up they're, with they're not, hospitals. Yeah, yeah, they're just going to, and they're just sort of going to do what they've already been doing. They have a presence yeah. in radiology and diagnostics. diagnostics but maybe get into more high-end testing, which a lot of diagnostic companies are already doing. Yeah. So this is um, maybe providing an integrated service in healthcare centers, uh, which they will do via tie-ups. Let's see how it adds in terms of revenues, but this is what uh, Krishna Diagnostics plan is. Time for a break now. Samit Javan will join in to discuss the technicals next. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Uh, holding a little over 17,000 for the Nifty. Important to get in a quick technical analysis with regards to individual stocks, etc. Trading strategies. Samit Chauhan of uh, Angel One joins us. Uh, Samit, your picks for today? We are expecting uh, some bounce uh, in the market. The uh, market is extremely oversold. Uh, so we would go with two buy ideas. First one would be, you know, Asian Paints. Asian Paint has a sturdy structure. It has been maintaining its, uh, you know, series of higher highs, higher lows since last uh, three or four months. And today we are seeing good traction. Stock is on the verge of a breakout from its, you know, worry flag pattern. So we expect Asian Paints to do well. Uh, the immediate target to watch out for would be around 3650, 3680. As a trader, one can buy at current level. <clears throat> Excuse me, keep a stop loss somewhere around 3470. Apart from this, you know, United Spirits is the you know one stock that uh, we have been liking since last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, stock uh, seems to be in a consolidation mode, but with a broader perspective, we expect the stock to do well and will not be surprised to see the stock, you know, even surpassing 900 uh, in a span of a uh, couple of months' time. But uh, with a momentum perspective, we like this stock uh, for a target of, say, 885, 890. As a trader, one can keep a stop loss around 848. Okay, well, there's a big move that we're seeing currently in the cement stock. So don't lose sight of that. India Cements uh, is actually up almost about 9% right now. Um, and volume is also looking pretty good. Samit, thanks a lot for joining in uh, and uh, have a great day. Let's slip into a quick break. Up next on our special series, the CNBC TV 18 Weekender, we'll get you an exclusive conversation with CK Venkat Raman, who's the Managing Director of Titan. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, for, the, for the markets, it seems to be quite a choppy session. So we have the mid-cap index, which is holding its head above the water at this point in time, up around four-tenths of percent. But the nifty as well as the bank nifty have flattened out and moved into the red, respectively. So we have the bank nifty, which is down around two-tenths of percent. You could probably expect this kind of choppiness to continue, considering the kind of volatility that we've seen in the Asian markets. Um, well, on to our special series, however, the CNBC TV 18 Weekender. Our colleague Mangalam Malu got up close and personal with Titan's Managing Director, CK Venkraman. Let's listen in to a slice of that conversation. Mr. CK Venkraman, what does CK stand for? Not a lot of people know this. Uh, it stands for uh, Koyambuttur Krishnamurti Venkraman. It's quite a mouthful, right? <laughs> what happens is in the boarding card, it gets expanded like that. And there was a recent trip I made where they forgot to put a gap between Koyambutur and Krishnamurti. <laughs> so you can imagine a string of letters from C all the way to Y, which was some 30 letters or something. <laughs> one word, one That's name, yeah, yeah. presumably one name. Yep, yep, yep. And the air hostess was welcoming each uh, uh, passenger by calling out the name. Yeah. And looking at the boarding card and said, Mr. Malhotra, Mr. So-and-so like that. She looked at it and looked at me and said, Okay, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> is the length of the pandemic impacting your business now or everything is back to normal? I think in our minds, we have certainly uh, put COVID behind us and got used to it as another kind of illness that we have to live with. And has that reflected in the business as well? First quarter numbers, phenomenal, phenomenal numbers. Has that sustained into the second quarter, the momentum, your thoughts for uh, the remainder of this year? You know, very, very bullish about uh, as we speak, as well as the second half of the year, even the mood or message from the recently concluded jewelry show. Hmm. It happens annual show, which happens yes. in Mumbai. The mood, the orders placed by the jewelers on the vendors is an indication of their positivity. It's very, very strong. You're not too far from the 35 to 40,000 crore revenue mark this year. Uh, I guess uh, not. I think, uh, you know, the first quarter was a very, very good uh, beginning mm -hmm. and we're just you know, continuing that thinking, certainly. Because mm -hmm. finally, we still have eight months left or thereabouts and irrespective of how each month may play out, it is our uh, desire to, you know, trust. And our focus is rather more on sales growth, rather more on gaining more competitive advantage in each of the businesses, rather more on building the Horizon 3 and the Horizon 2 businesses, and worry less about the profitability, certainly in FY23. Because if we do all that, 
it can go like this, FY25 and then up. So you have the 60,000 uh, crore target no, for so the jewelry business. In the, uh, Ajoy spoke of 2.5x uh, yes. in the investors conference and uh, we announced a big one for the international business, a big one for Tenera and so on and so forth. Okay, that was quite an uh, interesting and entertaining uh, interview with CK Venkatraman, the MD of Titans. You can watch that all day today exclusively on CNBC TV 18. Before we slip into a break, here's some great news for investors. You can now, in fact, track US market action real time on Money Control. Log on to Money Control's website or the app and stay informed about all that matters in the global market. Welcome back to Halftime Report. So the market has definitely recovered, right? We've been telling you that for a while. Now the Nifty has sort of moved into flat terrain, uh, down just about 28 odd points. Couple of stocks deserve mention though. Liberty Shoes has hit a fresh 52-week high and that stock is up over 81% this year. It's been a phenomenal ride. Uh, the stock is up 12.5% right now and big volumes on Liberty Shoes as well. Uh, there's of course an increase in demand. Uh, raw material costs have come off. And there's a big growth that we're seeing in the e-commerce space and hence a lot of these companies are benefiting from that. A couple of other names, Tejas Networks is another one that's hit a fresh high today. It's up almost 56% this year and uh, the stock is seeing good volume traction today as well, up almost about 5 odd percent. So these are just a list of stocks. I was telling you earlier about India Cements as well. A lot of stocks in the broader markets are seeing gains of anywhere between 5 to 8 odd percent. Uh, something like a Tanla platform, Root Mobile after the interview with the management yesterday also looked pretty good. So let's do one thing, let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, Manisha Gupta will join in. With her is Carlos Mera Arzeno of the Rabo Bank to give us an update on the world of commodities. Stay tuned. Welcome back and joining us on the show now is Carlos Mirarzano from Rabobank. Carlos, hi, good to have you. It's early morning for you and thank you so much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. I want to start with some of these industrial agriculture commodities. So whether you look at a coffee which has uh, seen some strength today, but a very sharp decline is how we are dealing with the palm oil prices down 5% right now, down 50% now from 2022 highs. What's your sense on both of these? <laughs> Well, I guess it's a dominant story nowadays in the markets, and that has a lot to do with recession and, and increasing um, uh, reference rates across the world. And the expectation of a recession, of course, influences some commodities more than others. Of course, the um, industrial commodities and, and, of course, palm oil is used in biofuels quite a lot, uh, a little bit more affected. And also the luxury uh, commodities, um, when it comes, for example, Coffee, we can argue, but certainly cocoa uh, mm. has been affected by by that expectation of a recession because as a luxury item, uh, the demand side is going to suffer uh, relatively more in a recession scenario. Mm. Carlos, also when I look at uh, the cotton prices, we are at a one-year lows onto this one as well. The weak global demand and as you said, the recession fears, hike in interest rates, strength in US dollar, all of that seems to be weighing on this one too. Yeah, yeah, I think to some extent, of course, we had a uh, disastrous U.S. crop. Uh, crop conditions for cotton has been uh, really, really adverse, as well as in, in a number of other commodities. Um, but the, the demand side for uh, cotton garments will suffer more, and that, that will, of course, be in favor of uh, cheaper artificial fibers. Mm. Carlos, I just want to, you know, uh, rate out on what the commodities have done from the highs of this year. So when you look at cotton is down 43 percent, palm is down nearly 50 percent, rubber is down 27 percent, soybean is down 22 percent. Would you say that the inflation concerns that we were talking about in the previous quarter are no more there? And from here on, what is the view that you would want to take for many of these soft commodities? 
it's very hard to have a view because certainly in some communities you still have a bullish story. Mm. I mean, for example, if you look at the communities affected by the war uh, in Ukraine, I mean, the war now looks uh, longer and more severe with the potential annexation of part of Ukraine into Russia uh, um, from the Russian perspective. Uh, and, and, and that could affect all the commodities Ukraine exports. We might see the um, destruction of Ukrainian agriculture uh, in the coming years. We are going to have the, the wheat plantings that will probably come in 30% below last year, 30% mm -hmm. below normal. Um, so so when, when we look at wheat, certainly there are reasons to, to expect quite a bit of support. Uh, um, also, when we look at corn, uh, we still have La Nina. Uh, we have a situation in, in Ukraine, plus La Nina potentially affecting uh, South American uh, summer crops, uh, quite a bit of corn, but also soybeans. That might be affected or not. We just don't know yet. Okay. Um, so some commodities will remain supported, but everything that is a luxury item will suffer. Mm. But would you say that the worst in sense of price rise is behind us? And what's your sense on when do we see the demand cup, uh, picking up? I mean, this is this is part A and part two of the same story. I think the demand side is going to be uh, affected. I think we're going to see more pain. And this is part of the macroeconom uh, uh, macroeconomic story. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to you know, go through the winter uh, in the northern hemisphere, especially in, in Europe. And um, then we will see probably the demand recovering a little bit, but that, that will also depend on uh, the war and energy prices uh, going forward, all very uncertain. Mm. So Carlos, if, if you were to invest, if you were to advise an investment in any of the soft commodities right now or a lo on long or a short, time, a short side, where is more conviction coming in right now? Well, I, I cannot give advice, but I can tell you the trend seems to be that everything uh, that can suffer in a recession will be shorted. And I think that trend might continue for a little bit. I think cocoa bean prices might continue to suffer, for example. Um, I believe uh, coffee prices can also go down uh, because weather in Brazil, even though we might have a La Nina effect, the okay. coffee belly is a little bit further north might not be affected and that means next year production could recover um but but certainly when it comes to grains and all seeds i will expect a little bit more support um, and when it comes to palm oil as you mentioned it's, it's about 50 percent below the peaks seen earlier in the year um I, it's very hard to give a a, a price outlook we think it's more or less neutral but volatility is very much guarantee okay Okay, all right, Carlos, as well as Benicia, thanks very much for joining in and taking us through that conversation on the commodity space. With that, it's also a wrap on Halftime Report Business Lunch, just after a short break. Thanks for watching.